Father, we thank you because you've given us Jesus Christ, our lover, our savior, our guide, our burden bearer. He doesn't condemn us because we have problems. That's why he's our savior. That's why he's guiding us and that's why he loves us. Lord, we pray that you'll teach us more than ever before to cast all our cares upon Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we pray that we'll find that there is no friend, there's no support like Jesus Christ. And we pray that as the days go by, and as year rolls over years, that we'll know you to be a burden bearer more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. That Lord, we'll leave all our burdens at the mercy seat. And then with freedom, with anointing, and with power, we can go ahead doing what you have called us to do. We believe that you have answered, and we'll see the manifestation in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We'll give some brief moment now to the family, the family model for the church. I'll try to be brief, although it's a subject that demands a long period of time to deal with. But our seminars are so important because they give us the know-how of church growth and also the things that we need to know in various areas of our ministry and endeavor so we can be successful. And as a seminar following, this message. So briefly we'll be considering the family model for the church. We as ministers of the gospel are supposed to be examples and standards and models. And in particular in our marital life, family life, we need to understand that God has raised us up to be models. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hid. Geographers and historians have told us that in the days of old, Jerusalem, and Zion in particular, a part of Jerusalem, was upon the hilltop. And in the night, the light in the houses in Jerusalem served as a pointer, as a beacon to the travelers. Once they were traveling and they were sort of in the valley, and Jerusalem and Zion was right on the top of the hill, they will be able to see, and they focused their attention on that light as a guide. And Jesus spoke to his own disciples. And he said, every one of the disciples in different areas were like cities set upon the hill to be a guide, pilot, and to give direction to the people that were traveling. And we need to say that in our churches, the pastor is like that. Whether he likes it or not, his pulpit is higher than the pews and that is a symbol of the fact that the pastor or the preacher is always set above the people and the people at the pew always have to look up when they look up they see the center of activity that's the pulpit the center of attraction and they see the direction in which things are going in the church it's not only when it's at the pulpit every time it's set above the members of the congregation as the eyes of the children look up to their fathers so the eyes of the members of the church are looking up to the model that the pastor or the preacher is given in the church in particular in our family lives the people can see and it will be good if our families are actually the models for the church for the families in the church in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers 
in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. I know that Paul the Apostle gave this to Timothy by inspiration of the Spirit of God concerning the general life. But as we look at this and we approach it from the angle of the family, we begin to ask ourselves, what are the things that sometimes miss in our families and then the church members might be telling the others, oh, you better not look at this example concerning the family. What are the things that miss out? What are the things, on the other hand, that the Sunday school teachers will be teaching? And when it comes to the family, and that Sunday school teacher, if he knows the family of the pastor very well, might say, church or class, I don't need to say much. You know the family of the pastor. Anything I forget to say here this morning, in this Sunday school class, I want you to look at the family of the pastor. The example is so bright, so encouraging, and he has led us in his family life that really we don't need any other teaching. But just in case you have not seen his family and how the model is, let me just say these few things. But if I don't complete the lesson in the class today, our pastor is a model for the family. What will the Sunday school teacher see before he'll be able to make such a comment in the family? Let's look at this again. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word. What makes up the family? Words. The families will be built up depending on the type of words we speak to one another. And the families might be destroyed depending on what type of words we speak to one another. Kind words, encouraging words, profitable words, gracious words, uplifting words. That the man will not even know there is any defeat or any problem. Because the tongue of that wife is the tongue that will speak out gracious words, encouraging words, words that will edify. But if, on the other hand, that woman has not gone to the school of Christ to know when to speak a word in season to the one that is weary, to the one that is discouraged, the words that the woman may be speaking might make the man to feel there is no essence and there is no sense in wanting to live anymore. You see, we live on words. We die on words. And then in conversation, you know, happy is, this, is that family when the wife knows when to bring about the conversation of uh, the demand of the mother-in-law, the demand of the, of the sister-in-law, and then the needs of the children. If the woman will just make the conversation at any time, she doesn't know when the pastor is thinking of a particular program, and she doesn't know when to talk about a particular disagreement they had before. How do you feel that we're preparing to go to church in the morning? And um, a woman is, you know, like many women, they have a lot of things to pick up. And just at the time we're about late, the woman remembers there's something I left again. And went back into the, you know, into the house. And you are saying, look, I do not want to be late to this service. Hurry up. I know that's what you always say. You never appreciate me. In fact, if it were not just the will and the grace of God, I would have left this family. No woman, there's no fighting. I just said, hurry up so we're not late for service. Yes, in fact, I've been willing to tell you something that happened on Friday. And um, eventually the one begins to talk. And she spoiled your sermon. You wanted to talk about love and about the grace of God and about how to live together. And uh, you tried to be quiet. But she came back to the vehicle as we were going. And you felt that she would respect the fact that there's, you know, there's need for privacy. The driver is there, the gospel, the driver of the gospel van. And uh, while you are going, you think I've finished, I've not finished. If I didn't tell you everything in my mind, I can't hear any sermon you are preaching today. And the driver is in the vehicle also. And eventually, you get to the church. 
Now, what are you to pray about now in the church? About the family problem or about the church service or about your wife or about God, the, the fact that God should give you a wisdom to live with this woman? She's ruined the Lord's day for you. I'm saying that the family is built on words and built on conversation. And also in charity, that's love. That the, uh, the wife will know how to love the husband. And the wife, the husband will know how to love the wife. How do you love your husband? Those of us who are sisters here. Well, the Bible says that we should love one another as Christ has loved us. But the question is, how has, the, how has Christ loved us? I'll tell you. We know that all the Greek words, agape and phileo and all those are Greek words, how he loves. He went to Calvary, he loved. He went to this, he loved. He went to that place, he loved us. He did this, he loved us. Yes, we know. You love your husband like you love your baby. If you don't think about it, you cannot understand. Just the way you love your baby, the way you care for your baby, the way you speak to your baby, when your baby has fallen, how do you love that baby? You pick that boy up, you peel that girl off, and then you begin to sing. That's what to do when your husband has made a mistake. And when you know that something has gone wrong in the life of that baby, you don't beat that baby to death. You remember the nine months that you carried that baby. You love that baby in spite of whatever that baby has done. Love your husband like you love your baby. And you'll discover that psychologically, that man still has the baby life inside. Likes to be cared for. And when he's not cared for, he doesn't cry like the baby, but he complains. And it's worse than a baby. A baby will cry without abusing anybody. A baby will cry without saying, you mother, you must be ignorant. But a man will cry and abuse and criticize. Be very, very critical. Take care of that man like you take care of a baby. How do you love your wife? You need to see the wife weep and know that the wife is to be cared for like a baby. Take care of her. Love her. Fellowship with her. Be loving. Be lovely. Just like you will do to a baby if you've been looking for a child for about 15 years. And eventually that baby came after 15 years. I dare tell you, you will love that baby. That's how to love one another in the family. Don't think that a problem is too small. Your wife has a particular problem and um, you prayed for other people. She herself has counseled other people and then she came to you and said, Pastor, uh, my husband, um, you know, suffering from little headache. And so what? So all these years you cannot pray for little headache. I won't waste my time with a wife that will not develop and grow. Therefore, go and take care of yourself. Ordinary headache and you are coming to waste my time. You know the fact? The wife is not coming just before, because of the headache. The wife is coming because she saw you sitting down two hours counseling somebody else's wife. Three hours counseling somebody else's wife. And the wife felt, if they are taking this man's attention like this, let me take, even if it is only 30 minutes, let's sit down and talk. And the, and the woman said, what will I, how will I get this man's attention and talk? Oh, I remember this little headache. That's a good point to start. <laughs> so that's why it's very, very important that we appreciate one another. We love one another. The point I'm making, my brothers, my sister, is this, that when we're very simple at heart, in conversation, in word, in charity, in love, and in spirit, that's not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's talking about our attitude, our disposition, the way we feel about one another. Do you realize that what, how you see things, how you see people depends on how you feel? If, as we are coming from the hostels or from the cafeterias, we went to eat, somebody did something, he said something nice to you, and you felt really happy. The very next person you meet, the way you greet that person, your disposition and attitude is very good. Because of that, relationship will be very good. But if somebody annoyed you, provoked you, did something very, very bad, the next person that meets you will get the brunt of the thing. 
He has not offended you, but it's unlucky to be around when you are not happy. And you know, our attitude is very, very important in the home. Keep yourself happy. Make yourself happy. Give yourself a good disposition at home. In spirit, in attitude, in disposition with one another. And then it says, in faith, believe God. Your wife may not be what you want her to be, but thank God she is not what she used to be. She is better than she used to be. And God who has made this change in her now will make a greater change in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's believe God for one another. And also for the children, for the husband, if you're a lady, if you're a woman, if you're a wife, let's believe God for the husband. Oh, we might say that my husband is too busy. Thank God your husband is busy. There are other women in the church who are crying, not because their husbands are too busy, but their husbands are going to pop houses. They're going to hotels, and they're carrying women. Thank God that your husband is too busy preaching the gospel. Thank God that your husband is too busy praying. Don't you think it is better kneeling down in that place? At least you know how to locate your husband. You know that he's at the prayer room. He's at the prayer closet. You know that he's not somewhere outside. And the more a person prays, the more he's far away from the devil. And so when you complain, my husband is busy, my husband is busy, aren't you grateful to God your husband is not an athlete that will be sponsored by Nigeria to go to Korea to go for the Olympics? And you don't know what they're doing there. Aren't you happy that your husband is not a businessman that will travel from Germany to America to Europe looking for business and looking for more than business? And you are here in Nigeria. Thank God your husband is busy for the Lord. But you know, when we don't understand, we'll be complaining. He counsels too much. Thank God for that. Because when a man counsels, he'll be talking about Christ, he'll be talking about God. How can you counsel without talking about God? Without talking about Christ? Without talking about the Bible? Without talking about the Gospel? And when your husband is busy like that, talking about wonderful things and good things, let's thank God for it. You know some husbands that complain that their wives pray too much? How lucky you are. Other people are complaining that their wives don't know how to pray in public or in private. And your wife prays too much. Keep that wife. That's the pillar of that home. Now if you have read about evangelists and pastors and preachers of past generations, you would have heard this story about women, two women in particular, that will stay in front of the church every time in the congregation. All they'll be doing will be to pray for that man. I heard a story from a minister that there was a time that this minister was just uh, you know going on and he was preaching the gospel with great power with great anointing and he was surprised that the miracles that were happening the things that were going on in his ministry they were greater than his own prayer life and I, he used to think he didn't understand that uh, this god is wonderful he felt it was the sovereignty of god that, you know god just does that sometimes but he knew that there were two women old women they couldn't evangelize they didn't have money to give but they dedicated themselves to praying and the ministry was going on expansion was going on and people were coming into that ministry money flooded into that ministry but old men die old women die those two women died and they had the funeral ceremony well, they appreciated their lives and they said all the beautiful things they ought to have said. But they discovered the very following month that things were not moving as they used to move. And the pastor had not backslidden. He had not cut down his study life, his prayer life. Everything was still going on as ever before. And he went to the Lord saying, Lord, how? And then the Lord replied, your greatest supporters have been called home. And if, if you don't have another supporters like those two women who have now died, that your ministry will not continue as it ought, it ought to be. If you have a praying wife, praise the Lord for it. A wife that will remember that all the time you are preaching your message, she is praying through your message. And even before that message, you're telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm in the same ministry with my husband. I'm lifting up the hand of my husband like Moses lifted up his hand. And Joshua was fighting on the battlefield. If you have a wife like that, never complain, never complain, never complain. Just praise the Lord that your wife is um, really prayerful. 
You know, pastors that will get unhappy and sad if the wife went to attend night vigil with members of that same church in the church building. And uh, they say, well, you are my wife. Oh, yes, she's your wife. That's why she needs to support you in prayer. That's why she needs to lift you up before the throne of grace. But you see, the spirit and the faith, and then the purity. What tracks families and homes? When there is suspicion that the wife is becoming too close to other men, there is that jealousy in the heart of the husband, and good jealousy, necessary jealousy, to watch over that woman. And when the woman feels that the wife or the husband is getting too close to other women, other ladies, she begins to lose confidence in the ministry of that man. And will begin to suspect maybe it is because of this and that, that this man is always leaving the home. But the point I'm saying is this. The things on which the homes are built are these words that are written here. And you be an example, you be a model in the family, in word. Weigh those words before you speak them out. Don't let your word be like razor blade. Instead of cutting the beard, it cuts the throat. Do not, be, do not let your word be like dagger. That instead of digging uh, the ground, it's digging the grave of the family partner, of the husband or the wife. But let your word be encouraging. And study. Learn. What makes your husband or what makes your wife unhappy? And avoid those things like you avoid a snake. Avoid any word that will cut down, that will make another person sad or unhappy, like you will avoid a poison. Your word, your conversation, and the charity. You know, sometimes when we're outside and we meet strangers, we like to be very, very nice. Have you noticed what our wives do when we have visitors? I mean, visitors that may be in the church hierarchy, like you are a pastor, and your general superintendent has come to visit your family. You know what your wife does? Your wife takes the best plate, and then the napkin, and everything, and sets the table. She wants to impress your general overseer. And the general overseer eats the food, and he said, my, my. If I eat this every day, I'll be a lucky man. But that's only done once a year when the general overseer comes. Well, why don't you tell your wife and say, my wife, so you know how to take care of somebody like that? That's what I want every day. You know, but we're so nice to visitors. We're so nice to the people we see once a year. Wives, be nice every day. And that man will never forget you. You won't have any problem that the man has traveled far away and he doesn't remember home. He'll remember home because of those little, little things that have been happening. Because of the things that we've been doing. And the same thing with the husband. Try to impress your wife. You know, how we impress other people and we take care of other people when some new people are coming into the church. Women. Not because we want to do anything bad with them, but because we love them and want them to get saved. How we take care of them, how we smile, how we give them good words, and we say, you know, this is the type of church you really need. And that woman will leave that place and say, how can a pastor be that kind? I'll go back to that church again. Now you are able to do it to the people that are coming to the church, to the converts that are coming to the church. Do it to your wife. Practice on your wife. Practice love with your wife. Practice being kind with your wife. And all the good qualities we're trying to do to outsiders and visitors, the place to start it is with our wives. Now I come back to Timothy. That Timothy was told, be an example, be a model. And if we're going to be a model in our families, these are necessary things where we will be model. We mustn't model or pattern our families after the world. Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and in verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let us not pattern our families in any way to the world. Let us be a model. 
In fact, you know how Jesus taught? He taught mainly by two definite ways. Number one, by model. Number two, by instruction. How did he teach healing? He healed the people. He cast out devils. And the disciples, they saw him do it. That's the model. And after that, he gave instruction as to healing. How did he cast out devils? How did he teach the disciples to begin to cast out devils? How did they learn from him how to do it? By model and by instruction. He did it. And once they have seen him that he did it, after that now, they could do it and he could also give them instruction. How did they teach them? How did he teach them how to pray? They saw him praying. He prayed every time. In the morning, very early, they saw him wake up and go to a solitary place to pray. To pray. At a time of temptation, in at a time of trial, they saw him praying. And then just before he'll get into a great ministry, they saw him praying. And after he has done some miraculous things, he'll withdraw from the crowd. And he prayed. They saw that model. Seeing that model, they came to him and they said, teach us to pray. And then he gave them instruction on prayer. He did, he taught. He wrought, and he taught. So the one thing is that we will first of all give the model about the family. And giving that model, then we'll begin to give instruction. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. And in verse 1. The former treatise, have I made unto you, Philos, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. He began to do and teach. And so we need to understand that in the family setup, this is what we're to do. Let our families be the model, be the example, be the standard, be the pattern. And then after that, we'll be able to teach our members and the churches how it ought to be. And by the grace of God, our example or model will not be contradicting the instruction. What's the model? We're told in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We're told that the family is like a symbol, a type. An illustration for the relationship between the church and Christ. So then, if our families are pattern or model for families in the church, that will be to the glory of God. What do we do? What qualities or qualifications will be available in our families that will make our families what they ought to be? One, the two must be joined together. Not just living together. Joint together. Not just living together. In Genesis chapter 2. And verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. That word cleave is uh, a Hebrew word that actually means to be glued together. Have you seen the vulcanizers? What they do? They've seen that the tire has been punctured. Then they take another type of um, rubber, flattened out. Then they do everything that they ought to do and they glue the rubber on that tire to mend the hole. That glue is not just an ordinary gum. Very, very adhesive. That's the word cleave. That the husband and the wife, they are not just living together as blood, brother, and sister. They could be separated. They are not just living together as co-tenants. They could be separated. They are not just living together as people that happen to share the same bedroom and happen to share the same kitchen and happen to share the care of children. They are actually glued together. Glued together. The Jews had a way in their husbandry, in their agriculture, that they will take another plant and cut it off. 
and then the stem of another plant they will uh, plant them together they will merge them together and eventually because of what they have done you will see that both that stem and the one that is grafted in they now become they begin to bear the same fruit in fact if you didn't know when that thing was done you will think that they were all together and you know doctors um, they do something too when somebody has had an accident then they'll take flesh from one part and they'll graft it in to that other part that has been badly damaged and eventually the same blood will flow in that grafted part of the flesh and the part of the body that's cleaving together cleaving together to the point that the same love is flowing in the whole family and there is no difference and we're not reminding the wife every time saying uh, if you are not careful you'll go back to your mother's house we do not remind her of her mother's house she has left father and mother to cleave unto the man and uh, the wife also never you'll never be rude and say I heard a lot about your father you're just like your father you know some wives can say that after many years of marriage they think that those many years of marriage will give them the license to say anything they want at any time they want to say it but it should not be so we shouldn't remember all the things of the past we just cleave together love one another together now and the way you care for your hand for your feet the way you care for members of your body is the way you care for that wife or for that husband therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto the wife now you need to think about this question if you have left father and mother how often should you be seeing father and mother you know sometimes the mistake we make we allow our own parents to be living in the same house with us and our wives and we spend more time with them than even with that wife any decision we're going to take we go to mommy first and say mommy do you know i'm thinking about something now the wife has not even heard or if the parents are not living there before we ever discuss with that wife we go to our mother and we say mommy you know what i'm thinking of now what does the bible say leave father and mother and cleave unto the wife and eventually maybe the wife hears that and she said well uh, i don't understand you every decision you want to take you go to your mommy first and i'm just here almost like a maid almost like a cook ah you see please keep quiet that's the woman that brought me to the world i knew her before i knew you and if you think you are going to replace her you are joking that's my mother i love her very much let's be the model the model will leave father and mother and be and cleave unto the wife cleave unto the wife cleave unto the wife if we have not done it before we are going to start doing it now and uh, by the grace of god our families will be modeled in jesus name Amen. and it says therefore shall a man not a boy a boy can do it a boy is always going back to mommy mommy my leg is paining me mommy my hair is falling out mommy my clothes are dirty that's a boy and a boy shouldn't get married yet you shouldn't get married you'll become a man and if you are a man you know one of the characteristics and the qualities of a man is that is able to leave father and mother without feeling homesick what do children do when we take them to school for the first time we take them to school and we say that's your teacher and the child begins to cry and we say child but you said you wanted to come to school yes mommy but i thought we'll be at school together i didn't know that going to school meant that you'll drop with the teacher and then you'll go back home that's a boy when we are married we are no more boys we are men therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto the wife and they two shall become one flesh so then marriage is the strongest relationship in life two lives becoming a unit with the same purpose and going in the same direction what are the elements in that relationship number one openness openness in genesis chapter 2 verse 25 we draw out a principle from here and they were both naked 
the man and his wife and they were not ashamed yes i know it refers to the physical but we need to go deep down be below the surface it means that we should be exposed to one another as husband and wife you know sometimes the husband is too too quiet too too quiet and he does it deliberately by controlling himself and he says well women talk too much i'll never reveal my mind to that woman but you know the relationship we ought to have in the home is a relationship of openness and there are wives that are strangely quiet too quiet they'll be thinking about that thing they'll be hiding that thing in the heart and they'll never talk about it the plans they have the purpose they have the goals they have it should not be like that and the element in our relationship should be openness number two it should be friendship and fellowship you know when two lives are together it will be unfortunate if one is still feeling lonely feeling neglected feeling isolated feeling rejected and not feeling part of the life of the other fellow but you know as husband and wife there should be that fellowship closeness and friendship in john chapter 15 jesus was talking to his own disciples and in verse 15 henceforth i call you not servants for the servant knoweth not what his lord doeth but i have called you friends for all the things that i have heard of my father i have made known unto you I thought about that. I felt that we'll need grace and the supernatural to be able to do that. Because those disciples couldn't manage the knowledge that Jesus Christ had. They were human. Not only that, they were not completely, 100% perfectly spiritual. Isn't that why we hide some things from our wives? We say, my wife is too human. My wife is too sentimental i thank god you didn't marry an angel maybe you are looking for an angel to marry the angel is perfect and you are not perfect you'll not be able to live with that angel you'll get into trouble every day thank god you married a human being i said thank god you married a human being Amen. because um, you know those angels are terrific when we get to heaven you'll see that they are terrific and that you married a person that can bear with your incompetences, with your imperfection, with the little, little problems you have too, I think that's wonderful. And if she is able to bear with your imperfection, then pay her back and, and live with her imperfections. If she is not as she ought to be, remember you are not also as you ought to be. I know you never tell her, but you tell God when you are praying. When she is around, you pray quietly and say, God, I'm not as I ought to be, but don't, don't let anybody know this, but make me better. But when she is not around, you pray it aloud. Then she is not as she ought to be. Bear with her. Do not say because of that, you'll hide your mind, you'll hide your heart, you'll hide your plan away from her. You are together. You are together. Jesus said, I call you no more servants. Because a servant does not know what his master or his Lord is doing. But I've called you friends. Because everything, think about it. Everything the Father has given unto me, I have revealed unto you. That's what ought to be in our family. There should be mutual support as well. Mutual support. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading verses 3 and 4. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Likewise also the wife unto the husband. Let the husband think about the needs of the wife. And let the wife think about the needs of the husband. You know sometimes uh, we have uh, this uh, thought. We have forgotten what the scripture says. That uh, women are weaker. Physically. But then we overwork them. And sometimes our wives, they work more than the husband. She'll cook. She'll go to the market. And, um, you know, sometimes if you have a vehicle, and you drive yourself, or you have a driver that drives, 
and she was going to the market for you to drive that vehicle and get to the market and say yes my wife and go around and buy this and that ah, if people see me do that they'll think that uh, that is too much that i'm spoiling that woman no you are not spoiling that woman jesus took a bowl of water and publicly he washed his disciples feet and if jesus our lord and master can so do that for his own disciples was too much for us to do for our wives and then the wife will go to the market then we'll come back we'll do all the cooking after doing the cooking she dare not eat first we have been resting and reading bible and relaxing listening to gospel music listening to records listening to the bible listening to messages and we are not tired at all the woman is worn out and tired and now the food has been finished everything is set on the table and you know who eats first the one that doesn't need the food is the one that eats first and the one that actually needs the food is still waiting at the kitchen because she cannot sit on the table to eat with the husband. No, I am the head. I thought your body and your head remain at the table at the same time. But you know, we should be able to correct all these things and know that the woman has been tired and therefore will care for her and say, Oh, my wife, come and sit down. Which one do you want to eat first? That may look little, but that woman will be impressed and say, This man really cares. And when she's a little bit tired, oh, you say, my wife, you need rest. Go and rest. But I've not finished washing. I've not finished sweeping. Oh, yes, I don't want you to break down. You are so precious to me, and I need you very much. Go and rest. And if anybody asks of her, you'll be staying there, and you'll be saying she is resting. And she needs that rest for some time now. And you'll be watching over her. That's marriage. That's love. And if we will do that if we will do that our homes will change in jesus name oh your wife will say i thank god i married a preacher and she'll be able to counsel and while she's counseling she'll say oh you have that problem this is what my husband does this is how she, he takes care of me this is how he does this and does that you will not wait my brother that the clothes of your wife will be already torn and members of the church will be saying auntie mommy or mama whatever they call her your cloth is torn at the back and the woman will say yes i saw it but you know we're in the ministry you will not wait until that time you will see it first and you'll say ah my wife that's not how the bride of christ will dress how does Christ like to see the church? Nice, pure, well clothed. And if you need to deny yourself, you'll deny yourself. But my brother, we go, we travel out. Sometimes you travel out of your state. You come to Lagos, or you go to Nietzsche, or you go to Ibadan, or you go to Kano. What do you buy for yourself? Because I need that pair of shoes for evangelism. For when I appear on the stage like this, so that they will know that God has blessed my ministry. Thank God he has blessed your ministry. But are you going to have that, mini that uh, blessing all alone? Wouldn't your wife sometimes appear on stage with you as well? If they see you and see your wife, will they think that she's just uh, maybe a sweeper, a cleaner in your church? Take care of her. And whenever you go out, you travel anywhere outside Nigeria, anywhere, you are thinking about yourself, think about her. Those little, little things, they will make the marriage happy. Little drops of water make a mighty ocean. And the little deeds of kindness that we do to the wife, that you are not thinking about yourself, but thinking about her, it will go a very long way. And it says, the wife also see that she renders due benevolence to the husband. Well, we're not all married here, but we're adults. And I'll say this. You know, it's a shame on our families that the husband has to beg and beg and beg before there is relationship, I mean husband-wife relationship at night, as if the person is asking for something that is not his right. 
And the woman will be bluffing and will be saying, no, I don't have time for that now. I thought you were a preacher. Don't you have self-control? <laughs> yes, but Paul the Apostle in the word of God here says that to avoid fornication, let every man marry his own wife and let every wife have her own husband. And you know, sometimes when you have to beg and beg and beg and plead and sometimes if the pleading will not do, thank God nobody knows it outside. The, the strife, the force, and everything, that's not marriage. But the other side is this. You know, sometimes the man, after he has pleased himself, he feels that the wife is just there to supply the need of his own body. And he is not to supply anything to the wife. And if the wife at any time would say that, I need love, I need this, oh, the husband will feel shocked and say, what's happening to you? Are you backsliding? I understand when I, as a man, when I need to be pleased, but woman, what's happening to you? I will talk and talk and dress that woman down. But no, it's both ways. And it says, let the husband render to the wife due benevolence and let the wife on the other hand rend down to the husband due benevolence let's share together like that in fact the bible says that each of us we do not have power over our own body look at verse 4 the wife has no power has not power of her own body but the husband you know how some wives will keep their bodies away from the husband Especially if they, have, uh, if they have separate rooms. That that a woman will have her room in the night. And after saying good night, she'll hurry up. Because if she sees that the husband is trying to ask for anything, she'll get inside and lock that door and bolt it at the back. And if the husband uh, said, um, uh, knocked at the door, will say, what is that? I thought we said good night. And after saying good night, we'll say, uh, welcome again. How are you there again? We'll see tomorrow morning. Well, we need to discuss something. But why didn't you remember that before I came into the room? My sister, you don't have power over your own body. You're not dealing with a co-tenant. You're dealing with a husband. And we need to realize that in the family, that this relationship ought to continue. That I know I do not have power over my body. She knows she doesn't have power over her own body. That's exactly what the Bible says. And likewise, and in the same way, also, the husband has not power of his own body, but the wife. Here is where we need to talk to ourselves against the accusation of the devil. You know, sometimes um, when we're going to have a crusade, we have set a law for ourselves. And we have said, if I'm going to have a crusade, seven days before the beginning of that crusade, I must not come near that woman. Understand? That is not the law of God. That is your own personal law. It's all right for you if, it's, if your wife is in agreement. If your wife is not in agreement and you break that law, You know, sometimes we break that law. You made it for yourself. But let us understand. You made that law for yourself. If you break it, heaven doesn't have any record about it. It's not the law of God that you are broken. Oh, you just say, well, that's all right. A lot of laws we make for ourselves. And I said I will be eating um, 9 o'clock every morning. And 7 o'clock, I become so hungry. I break that law if I want to. That's my personal law. And I will not be judging myself. And then I cannot go to the crusade again because I broke a personal law that I made. And God didn't sign it when I made it. If God signed it, he'll carry it through. If you don't carry it through, God did not sign that thing. Therefore, forget it. And do not condemn yourself because you have relationship with your wife just before crusade. And then after that relationship, then you are praying, saying, God, forgive me. What's God going to forgive? Did you commit fornication or adultery? What are you asking forgiveness for? That God gave you a wife and you lived as he wanted you to live. God should forgive you. God help us to be free from accusation of the devil. 
our time is going. But um, it's important that we share our lives together. We share our room together. And you know the people that will say, I'm a pastor, I need a separate room. As if no other person must come in there. And if the wife is going to come to that room, she must knock. What's the matter with you? Do you have cocaine under your bed? <laughs> if there is no cocaine there, if there is no bad thing there, let the wife enter. You have the room together. You share everything together. The body, the car, the room, the money, the property, everything that we have, husband and wife, it belongs to both of us. And we need to realize that if we're going to be a model, then we should be committed to the practice of the golden rule every day. What you will not want that wife to do unto you, don't do, that to that, don't do it to that woman. Be very, very thoughtful. If this woman were to say this thing to me now, how would I feel? And when you measure your life with that golden rule, permanently, practically, and progressively, you'll find that the home will be a good home. What are the pillars in the home? Love, faith, hope, wisdom, and faithfulness. Love is a pillar, great pillar. You see all these poles that we have in this uh, building? It's the thing that is holding the tent. And it's the same thing in the family. It's the love that will hold the family together. The faith, confidence in one another. And then hope. Believing that things will be better. Hoping that things will be better in the life of the wife. And also in the life of the, of the, of the husband. Don't ever give up on your wife. Don't ever give up on your husband. And wisdom. Let's deal with one another in wisdom. Real wisdom. And let's be faithful to one another. Just these five points, and I close. According to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8, love her, love each other above the children. The husband of Anna said, my love to you is more than the love of ten children. Don't you realize that? And what a pattern for us. You know, sometimes when children come into the family, we talk, my children my boys and we act as if the mother is not important if the children are sick anytime we stay at home we care for the children if the wife is sick at any time we don't stay at home we love the children more than the wife and yet it is the wife that brought the children into the world change it over love that wife of course you love your children but love that wife love each other above the children it will be unfortunate if you ever beat your wife and it will be unfortunate if you ever beat your wife because of her own children and you say look at the clothes that this child is wearing don't you see this is dirty yes it's because i was too busy busy how to take care of my children no it's your children together and then you begin to fight with words before that little child you degrade the mother in front of her own children don't let us do that number two enduring affliction together that's what job's wife failed to do of course before we blame job's wife let's think about this that the information came that fire broke out and destroyed many things that woman did not talk the information came out that even all the children died we didn't hear the voice of that woman the information came that the, the, the thieves the Serbians, have taken all that they had and they have killed the servants we didn't hear any grumbling or complaint from that woman but when the things were growing and growing and growing, escalating, eventually even Job himself, he became so sick. That woman was broken down. I think before we blame him, we should understand that that woman tried. She bore some affliction with that man. 
Now, our wives, you know, sometimes they minister's, the minister's life is a hard life. Life filled with opposition, persecution, sometimes need and want. And it will be very good if we can suffer affliction together. That woman tried. But eventually, when he couldn't bear the rest of the whole thing, he said, curse God and die. But look at Job. How would you have spoken to your wife? All those things were left. All the people in the city, they were saying maybe had committed sin. Even your closest friends, they came and they were looking at you as if you must have committed the unpardonable sin. And your wife now spoke out and said, husband, end it up. Curse God and die. But Job, thank God for people like Job. He said, you speak like a foolish woman. Shall a person receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive evil? That was the end. That woman did not reply. I hope to see those people when I get to heaven. A woman like that. Oh yes, yeah, she said what she said. Just one sentence. Not that she kept on pestering that Job every day, every day saying, die and let me marry another man. But when the man said, why do you speak like that? Oh, I'm sorry. She kept quiet. Oh, for beautiful wives. Wives that will know when to talk and when not to talk. And we can bear afflictions together. Number three, replace the mother with the wife. That's in Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. When I see God married... He was comforted for the loss of the mother. The wife had replaced the mother. Number five, sacrificial giving. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. How Jesus gave himself for the church. Let's give ourselves like that to our wives. Number five, caring for the wife as vessel, weaker vessel. Vessel bearing good ointment you know when it says weaker sometimes we don't understand where it grew up we now say we were kept at drinking water it was a pot placed in a very cool surrounding whenever we wanted to drink water that's where we'll go that's the vessel weaker vessel weaker than the drum weaker than all the other instruments and utensils that were at home. But we went there and we took that water when I was very, very young. And it was cool, refreshing water. Maybe weaker, but having precious, life-giving flow. That's how to treat the wife. That even though that wife may be weaker than the man, emotionally and physically. Yet, there will be such care, there will be such love, that we know that through her will come the life-giving flow. Already I've said that our time is short. And I'll not be able to go into more details. But I believe that the things we've heard, though short, the Lord has ministered to us already. And we're believing that we'll have better families, happier families, lovelier families in Jesus' name. Whatever mistakes we have made in the past, we cannot kill ourselves for the mistakes of the past. God is a merciful God. He will forgive the past and he will give us the grace to now have our families for a model from now on. Let's rise up and pray. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer concerning our families. Now the Lord will make us the husbands we ought to be. We'll make our wives the wives they ought to be. Our precious Father, we thank you once again. For your love and care towards us in ministering to us in the area of our family accept our thanks in jesus name Amen. father in heaven you've made us ministers and as ministers you've told us that the pulpit is higher than the pew father we thank you for what you've done for us accept our thanks and praises in jesus name
because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Howard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. Same thing, and I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the loan. 